I'm from the University of Aachen. Um, this will be not a deep technical talk. Perhaps you might consider that being sucking. Um, <laughs> but, but if you want to pass some kernel structures in your mind, you can come to me afterwards and we can do that with a beer. Um, this is about hidden data in document formats. Many people assume I'm talking about or thinking about steganography when I'm talking about that. But I'm not interested in putting things in. I'm more interested in other people and other programs putting things in which are without knowing me. Basically, the thing is I'm at the university, um, and we have a lot of people working in theoretical security, and they discuss convert channels and uh, how hard they are, and look a lot into that from the theoretical perspective and the maximum bandwidth the convert channel has. And I wanted to look in that from a practical pers perspective and see how much data is out there on the Internet we don't know about when we publish it or when we publish the documents. Just a small demonstration. If I cre create a Word document, a simple one, save it, and then huh. <laughs> Oops. Then look onto it with the strings command. I see there's a lot of stuff in it already. For example, the text I've written in the document twice, my full name, um, the name of the format I used, the name of the Word version I used, an email address or something which looking like that, I have no idea what that means, um, some text strings, Pardon? I can try. So basically, no, I can't um, make it bigger. It didn't work. Um, basically, I did strings on a Word document, and there's a lot of stuff in it. That was just a teaser, so not really important information in there. Okay, and the problem are complex data formats we don't understand and we are not supposed to understand. Um, the people creating the programs which write these data formats have basically a, just trust us, buy our products and use them and don't care um, attitude. And even if the people publish the structure of their documents or the data format, um, we are usually not willing to understand them. Um, if you try to figure out how Microsoft Office documents structured internally, you usually or probably will get mad about that. So in all these documents, there are convert channels. Which tools did I use to look at um, the problematic documents? Um, mainly I looked at Word documents, uh, but on, on to, in, <laughs> into some other documents too. Um, I've, at first, I tried Word document converters, to, which are meant to convert MS Office documents over to text or something like that, anti-Word, CatDoc, and Word2x. Um, some of them are not very well maintained. Others are very good maintained. Um, but basically, um, that didn't work out that well. My first idea was to convert the Word document to text, then use a strings command to find other strings in the Word document and see which weren't covered by the conversation co process. Um, that was cumbersome and no fun. Um, I then tried to look more onto the metadata. There's something out there called Laula, um, which is a collection of documentations and Perl programs dealing with binary file formats of Windows programs. Um, it has a lot, uh, several programs in there. For example, something to get the trash section out of Word documents. I didn't know there was one in there. Um, get metadata in the Word document out there, um, the structure, and even password resolving. The problem with this Laola is that it was last touched five years ago, and Microsoft Office documents have evolved since then. And it is, was written in Perl, um, which I consider no fun hacking. So. This was a fun project. I went on looking for things. 
Um, if somebody really tries to dig deep into um, the Office document format, he probably should check LaOla because it seems to have a very sophisticated understanding in the OLE themes inside the Word document. Then there's VFeeWare, um, which is used actually by AbiWord, and um, KWord at least was trying to put uh, VFeeWare as a library into the um, program to read Microsoft Office documents. Um, the development is somewhat hard to understand. I really wasn't able to figure out um, which is the latest version and who is developing what, what and what is the latest name. Um, basically, I just used the Debian default package um, <laughs> to test it. It has tools to convert um, Word documents to text, HTML, and some other formats. And this has tools to read out the meta information in Word documents, VV summary and VV version. Just a small example of them. Is it big enough for you? So it's completely unreadable. <laughs> um, that sucks. <laughs> the problem is because it's an, um, I didn't um, took the work to co port it over to macOS. I did this tests on a um, Unix machine, and so I can't show it now to you. Basically, um, it can show you the version of a Word document, um, the summary, the subject, the author information, all that you put into the metadata of the Word document. Um, if there are comments in there, um, the template used the Microsoft Word version, the number of pages, the number of words, the number of characters, if it's encrypted, um, and which code page is used. Oh, that really sucks. Um, the programs in there include um, converting to DV, DVI, HTML, LaTeX, PDF, RTF, um, getting this meta information, text, and so on. And it actually works quite well. Um, it's probably something like viewing web pages and links, or links. Um, they don't look great, but at least you learn what's that all about. Then there's a very interesting tool, Word Dumper, um, which was done by Richard Smith of Computer Bytes Man. And he once had it on his home page, um, published it there. But now he hasn't, and even in the Wayback Machine, there's nothing to find about it, and at Google, too, not. But if you write to um, Richard Smith at the Computer Rights Man com domain, he is willing to give it out. At least he gave it to me. Uh, I think before continuing, I try to get the screen resolution somewhat better. Is that more readable, readable for you? Not really. Sorry about that. So now um, we will browse to some examples of hidden data in documents, not only Office formats. Um, you are very well invited to shout out if you are know, know of other examples, because I think that's mostly a thing um, we just stumble across by chance. It's very hard to um, systematically research this hidden data in the documents formats. One very obvious way are mail and news headers. I think the average nerd knows about them, but nobody else. And many programs put a lot of stuff in there. The program version, um, the news hosts used, the mail hosts used. Um, and so on, IP addresses from the machine connecting to the news server. So in Usenet, it was, when I last used it, 
very usable to flame people because they were using Outlook and these people were completely astonished how the flamers could know they are using Outlook because there was an additional header in there. Um, it might be embarrassing if you sell one kind of news or mail software and there's a header from another software in your postings because you use another software. Um, a very interesting incident was um, the biggest German ISP, T Online, which put your customer number into the news headers for abuse tracking or something like that. And the fun thing was um, in the mid 90s, your customer number contained your telephone number. So everybody got your telephone number who was able to show the headers of your news postings. Um, a year ago or something like that, they stumbled on that again. Um, the German government um, passed a law that every home page needs an imp imprint. And the online hosting millions of home pages created an automatic imprint service for the home pages hosted there, or not service. Practically, you had an imprint, there was an imprint put into your home page without you knowing or asking about that. Um, but the home pages also could be addressed by the customer number, which weren't identical to the telephone numbers now. But so you had a posting in Usenet, in the Usenet, and you, you wanted to flame the guy or something like that. You just went to the home page server of T Online, looked for the home page related, related to the customer number by just adding the customer number after homepages.tonline.de, and then went for the imprint file, which was always called, if I remember correctly, underscore imprint HTML. Um, and then you had the, the name and the address and the telephone number of the person doing that posting. Um, again, people were not aware of that um, and were very, very astonished when they wrote something and they thought they were anonymous and then somebody else was posting a reply with the address, telephone number and name of the poster. Config files. We could consider config files not really documents, but at least it's something which bites us all the time too. Um, the average software has so complex config files, at least Unix software, um, that you really can't just skim over it um, and have difficulties to understand what all the options are doing and which options are missing in the default config file. Um, this can result in security issues with misconfiguration, but also in disclosure of information. The prime example is Apache, which is in the default configuration, really fully telling every attacker or whoever else in the HTTP headers which version it is and on which operating system it runs and which modules are in there. You can change that by just one configuration directive, but you have to know. Um, more fun probably is BitX, um, which in the default conf configuration um, has a l message that if you leave the channel, BitX, before you leave it, posts to the channel, this guy is too stupid to configure his BitX or something like that. HTML, um, complex programs generate complex HTML. HTML. For example, if you look at a file generated by Microsoft Office, it's nearly unreadable for the average guy knowing just some hard HTML. Um, but even less complex programs and less complex HTML um, contains often information not really needed in there. For example, the meta generator tag, um, which has bitten, to my knowledge, for example, several times um, web companies which were using other tools that they claimed they were using, web design companies. And um, it's surprisingly often that um, you, there are still paths to local files in HTML pages. So and usually people have um, 
with local files in their personal folder in Windows, and the folder is named Joe Smith's files, so you can deduct the author of the file. Um, also, in HTML files, there are often comments left by the developers um, or um, commenting out content which is considered inappropriate or something like that. Um, I have found comments like, this really sucks, we have to redesign it. Um, but the most often um, the comments are just structuring the file, which is very nice if you are trying to grab content from, from an HTML page um, of a news page or so. If um, there are comments in there like, news item starts here, news item stops here news item starts here, news item stops here, that's very, very easy then to grab the content of that page. Um, one of the really fun things um, were de defaced web pages. Um, I think three years ago, people from uh, attrition.org spoke here on their experiences with their defacement mirror. And um, I thought it was one case, but Yesterday I asked them and they said in one of 500 defacements, the defaced page, this page was rooted by lead hexor, contained links to files on the local hard disk of the defacer and often there was the name of the defacer in there. Yeah, and then there's PDF. PDF looks somewhat open. There are the standard is documented and so on. But if you ever have tried to write a PDF parser, it looks much less open. Um, and Adobe is all the time extending it and putting the n latest and greatest stuff in their own applications and after that start documenting it. Um, one of the main problems is the problem of censorship or redaction. If people use PDF files to blacken out things you shouldn't know, um, that usually doesn't work. Incidents with PDF files, um, there's a very famous sniper letter, um, which was uh, in the Washington shootings. There were these letters left by the sniper, and the Washington Post published one of the letters um, and blackened all the information which wasn't for the public, for example, the number of the bank account where the money should be sent. And it was very easy to just um, remove this black bars and read the money of the bank account and so on. Then there was a report on the um, labor conditions in the Justice Department, and again, they blackened very much on that, and it was very easy to remove. And very famous was um, under the Freedom of Information Act, people have had um, gained access to a paper describing the actions of the CIA in the 50s in the Iran, and um, oh, half of the document in certain places was blackened, and this could be removed again. Um, so how can we exploit that in PDF? Um, in many instances, it turns out that the data was hidden by setting the background color of the text to black, and the text was black. We, we still then could... Um, mark with Adobe Acrobat standard the text and copy it. Um, we can cop co if the text is a graphic, because it's scanned in, we can copy that. Or we can copy, uh, copy it and put it somewhere else in. Or if there are black bars or overlaying graphics, we can just cut them. People usually say, uh, think PDF documents are not that editable at least if you are from the Linux world, um, but if you are willing to shell out all the money to the whole Adobe Creative Suite, you basically can do every manipulation on PDF file, and PDF is just another vector graphic format for you. Um, so that uh, what you can do about PDF files really boils down how much money you are willing to shell out to Adobe. A demonstration of that? Oops. 
So this was a diversity analysis by KPMG for the Department of Justice. And let's see. Here is some blackened text. And if I go now for select text and just select it. Yeah. That's a little bit difficult here because the text also is a link. So, copy, use a random text editor, no, not this. <laughs> and there it is, lost formatting, but okay. So, the next demonstration is well, remove the image under the blackened bars. That is a sniper letter, again, just Acrobat standard. I think that's the original version like it was put up by the Washington Post. And you see, select text. I can select this text, but not the other stuff because it's a graphic. So I go for select image, select that, copy, go to another program, new graphic from clipboard, and there it is. Um, I wasn't able to remove the black bars from a document with Acrobat, but with Adobe Illustrator, this is no really a problem. Okay, since Illustrator is not uh, for um, layout, I only can open a single page. I'm pretty sure that with InDesign I can work with um, multi-page PDF documents, but um, I don't have Adobe InDesign, and I think it would be wrong to steal it. So you obviously see there's a scanned text, and the black bar is a vector graphic because it's so sharp. I can mark it, move it around, <laughs> and kill it. So I was really astonished about PDF, and by far I had the most fun with PDF documents. <laughs> Sorry, dealing with MS is not that much fun. Um, the Office document format I said above is incredibly com complex, undocumented. It, I think they documented the version of Office 2000 or so, but it's a terrible mess and ever-changing. And it's well known that it's full of unwanted data, but I think nobody knows what's exactly in there. Um, I think the first time there was public discussion was in 1997, where it turned out that in every office document there's a general UNIC ID, a UID, um, of the author. And this UID also contained the MAC address of the machine creating the document. Um, and this was one of the factors which helped to um, find the author of the Melissa virus because it was a word macro and therefore a word document. Um, and I think it was also used in convicting him. Um, Microsoft found out that it probably is not a good thing, or they, at least they thought were falling to the public pressure, and um, gave out a patch to remove this um, UID from documents, but also a patch to patch Office 97 to not put it in again. So there's a news from CNET, Microsoft admits privacy problems and plan to fix it. Shortly after that, um, Richard Smith found out that there's also the history of the last 10 file names this document was saved to looked into the yearly report of Microsoft and found out that it was created on a Mac because the Mac uses colons to separate path names and um, Windows machines slashes. It's, you can be pretty sure if you see a Mac file name. And um, Jerry Lace G3 desktop folder really looks like a Mac. Uh, 
Um, a nice thing to note if you can read it in one of the lines of the middle, the Microsoft yearly report was also saved in temporary items auto, auto recovery. So probably while editing it, um, their own program crashed. Okay, but, but Microsoft plans to fix the problems. So for Word 97, there's a knowledge base article, how to minimize metadata in Word documents. That's good. Oh, they haven't fixed it in Word 2000. How to minimize metadata in Word 2000 documents. Oh, but the future is there, the next <laughs> millennium. How to minimize metadata in Microsoft Word 2002 documents. Oh, and you saw it coming. <laughs> How to minimize metadata in Word 2003 documents. Um, the Office suite for, Mac, for the Mac is now Office 2004. I think there's no Windows 2004 version. I wrote them, and I hope there will be a knowledge base article sh shortly how to minimize metadata in Word 2004. Um, so what's in there? We don't really know because the document format is not well documented. But there, if you look into the how to minimize metadata document, there's how to remove your username from your documents, how to remove personal summary information, how to remove personal summary information when connected to a network, how to remove comments, how to remove headers and footers, how to remove revision marks, how to turn off fast save, how to search and re remove text format as hidden, how to remove hyperlinks in documents, how to remove styles in documents, how to remove old file versions from documents, so they are in the document too, uh, in the same file, how to um, remove links to file codes that are specific to the machine the document is edited in, how to remove the template name and location, how to remove routing slip information, how to remove the name of the previous authors, how to remove your name from the Visual Basic code, it's in there too, how to remove Visual Basic reference to other files, how to remove network hard disk, inform or hard disk information, embedded objects in documents and may contain metadata, document variables may contain metadata, and general suggestions about security. That sounds like a whole lot of stuff in the Word document. I'm very unhappy I wasn't able to find all of that um, because I used only very crude tools to analyze Word documents. Some famous incidents with Word documents, probably the most famous at last in Germ uh, Europe is a USK Iraq dossier. Um, and then there was in Germany a very interesting thing where um, it basically came out that they made up numbers for a huge pro planning project. And the thing with the Melissa virus, I already told they that they caught the Ma Melissa virus by looking for the UID um, of the original posting of the virus. Um, this is an Iraq dossier. Basically, um, in Great Britain, the British government published a dossier that the Iraq is so dangerous and has weapons of mass, dis mass destruction um, and is going to bomb the whole world in the next week if they don't start a war. Um, probably you know similar stories. Um, but the document about that they put on the web um, contain this autosave information um, and the path of the file hinted very strongly to the names of four people. And so it turned out that basically the document um, was a spiced up version of a more or less um, inter internship project of somebody in the foreign ministry there. Um, I think that nearly the, this thing is still going on and I think it's at least nearly coasting the British, um, oh, what is it, president? No. Um, no, not taxpayer, Tony Blair, and his, his prime, minister. prime minister, exactly, <laughs> his chair. Um, the other document was um, in Germany, um, there are several huge projects underway um, 
for example, the Germans have this very nifty um, magnet levitated high speed train, but nobody wants to buy it. Um, and so they want to use it themselves, use their own dogs, uh, eat their own dog food. Um, and there was a study saying, oh, if we build this thing um, to the rural area, um, we will make shit loads of money by that. Um, and if you, they, they published a document and the, in the, on that, and basically if you go, went back in the edit history, they say that uh, you saw that they added a zero to all the income and removed a zero from all the um, costs. Um, other documented incidents in, include um, that there was text from a completely unrelated document in another document. So somebody that was posted on the Risk Digest edited a document, saved that, closed the file, created a new file, wrote something in there, and in the new file, if you looked there with strings or something like that, you saw that there was a text of the first document in there. And that is this edit history, data deleted from a document, or is, which is overwritten, appears in the file. So to some other format, which looks so nice and so unproblematic. Um, but image formats usually contain at least a comment field. Um, and the, these comment fields are not used that much. Um, so most imaging po software um, puts its own name in there, created by the GIMP, for example. Um, and that might bite you in the butt too if you are selling some imaging software and there's something in, then that's created by something else. That's as a comment in. Um, JPEG itself has an extendable header format for adding, adding metadata like camera type and exposure and um, color calibration information and thumbnails. And there was a very remarkable incident with Exif thumbnails in JPEG documents, um, which is quite juicy. Um, some moderator put some picture of herself on her weblog, um, and the picture of, was created by cropping the original image. And the problem was the original image still contained the, un uh, the thumbnail still contained the uncropped image, which is really, I wouldn't have thought of that checking my thumbnails before putting out my images. Um, other things in document formats, I think very famous was the star report, which was created in WordPerfect and then converted several times. And in the star report, as published first, several footnotes um, turned up, which, which were deleted before and came up in the conversation project process again. Um, and where along the line, here this dump ass is probably lying or something like that. Um, very, very many document formats embed serial numbers, uh, so the serial number of the software you use cr to create the document, or uh, um, GUIDs again. Then there are um, in the documents sometimes, especially with with shareware, it's information that the software you were using is unregistered, that may be in a mail header, um, that may be in a footer where you see it, but in complex document formats, it might be, might be anywhere. You really don't have any idea if you don't know the document format. Um, another example is Adobe InDesign puts a list of all the fonts you have installed on your machine um, into the documents. And if you are a print shop or something like that, you're probably very heavily into font wares trading. Um, and having a list of all your wares in every document you give out is a problem. So I really wanted to know what's, what's really out there. I think writing a document in Word, saving it, and looking for the things in there is not that interesting, and I don't use Word that much. So I went out to the internet um, and tried to get as many office documents I could get. Um, I crawled the web. I have a tendency into writing web crawlers. So basically, um, 
I was like the director of the first Blues Brothers film. Yeah, I have this film with with this guy, and and then I have a car chase, and it would be so great. And I make this car chase and car chase and kitchen. Ah, and then there are these guys again. And then I make again a car chase, and it was oh, I make something about documents. And then I write a web web crawler, and it will be so cool and so fast and not multi-threaded, but unblocking. I oh, and ah, okay. So I spend <laughs> spend most of my time writing the web crawler. Um, you can get it from my homepage, the recent version. <laughs> um, and yeah, originally I wanted to hack all this Word document parsing tools, but there was no time because I had to spend all the time writing the web crawler. Uh, <laughs> and my office machine now in the university has a very juicy, juicy internet connection. Um, by basically, I can really do 5 Mbit to the internet without a problem, so writing a web crawler was really fun this time. Um, before I always had to do it from my home DSL line. Okay, um, so download the documents and then mm -hmm, then have a short look on the documents, save them so, and save them on a DVD for further research. Um, that was at least was what I did. It was not what I had in mind when I started the project. Um, the really problem is how to how do I detect the data in Word documents? The strings command is a help, but at, with Unicode. It doesn't work that nice, and if um, there's some binary or compressed data in that, for example, that thumbnail, um, I have no way of finding the stuff without knowing something about the document format. Um, while I was um, writing my web crawler, um, some other guy published a document on that in the e IEEE Security and Privacy. Um, and here's some interesting results. You can Google the title of the, docu uh, of the article and find it on his homepage. He basically um, refrained from writing a web crawler and just used e Google for find the documents, to find the documents, and so he had some time to look at the documents. Um, but but he, um, when looking at the documents, he took a different approach, so probably I have to contribute something too to that. Okay, about why crawling the web fast is fun and hard. I think I told that again. Uh, my actual crawler used for that is called Lens 3. Uh, the, the first one, Lens 1, was actually a crawler for gopher space, so it goes far back. Um, and um, I used it for directed crawling, testing that, so really hunt for Word documents and not trying to get all the internet. Um, yeah, you can get it at the, the address down there, core 23, new code, um, lens 2. I think it is there. Um, I wasn't able to check because the internet is somewhat difficult here. I think there are fats tapping all the lines and that's why it didn't, didn't work. I think hackers wouldn't break the internet. Um, when I found out that I spent too much time writing my own crawler, I tried another approach, Niels Provost crawl, which is not doing directed crawling. Um, but if you want to um, do fast and simple um, downloading of Word documents and don't care about bandwidth and nice code, um, just grab his crawl thing and apply a patch, uh, again at core 23 new, um, which crawl originally was built to spider for JPEG images, not because Nielsen likes porn so much, um, but because he was looking for steganographic data hidden there. Yeah, question? Uh, that's a zero for sure. That's a lead group. <laughs> you know, there are these core SA people which are not that lead, obviously, because they don't have a zero in there. Um, yeah, and at least Niels Provost thing was fast, if not efficient, uh, and I think all in all, I got about um, 150,000 documents I have now li laying on my hard disk and see what to do with that. Um, I, I used search engines, uh, the, the, the result pages of search engines to f feed them into my own crawler and then the crawl crawler, so I used random words and document type Word document in Google and other search engines, and the result pages I saved and used the URLs in there to start the crawlers. Um, I saved all documents with the MIME types, 
Yeah, you see them. It's very interesting. There seems to be no standard for MIME typing MS Word documents. Um, and even if there was no Microsoft Word or Office um, specific MIME type, I saved the files if they were named doc, PPT, or XLS. Um, with the PowerPoint files, I really hope to analyze them later for speaker notes and hope to find some juicy details in there. Um, so I collected, yeah, I told before, 150,000 um, Word documents, and basically I just used all document converters and document information finders to batch run and to batch in batch mode on that um, and skimmed the results saved to a file by hand and by my eye. Um, yeah, while writing a crawler, which is a very interesting thing, I saw unbelievable misconfigurations of web server. I think the funniest one was status code 226, which makes no sense in HTTP but in SMTP. So I had seen a web server thinking it was a mail server. Um, so can you read that? Oh, that sucks. <laughs> okay. I, I used the tool by Richard Smith, Word Dump, he sent to me. Um, and this is a document by MS Office 3000, which contains very, very little information, or at least Word Dump, which stopped being developed, I think, at 99, can't pass it. Um, for example, to go back, Word Dump, dump reports um, the document as created by Word 97, build date of the file, 8th of April 2003. Um, some other document um, is by, created by MS Office and it contains still this revision log, so the last 10 file names. Um, this is an example for a document which has the GUID in it, which is created by Word 97.2, or at least the Word version um, being built at, in 1998. Um, the GUID is the thing in the uh, fifth last line or something like that. So this is a very interesting document um, because of the five times it was saved, uh, of the ten times it was saved, um, five times it was saved with the name Auto Recovery. So probably the guy using the machine to edit this document has a machine which is crashing very, very often. Um, if, if this is from a computer shop, you probably don't want to buy your computer there. Um, this is a very interesting document I found on the OECD website, which is an international organization. Um, and it seemed to be, I never really looked into the real document, it seemed to be a protocol about a session they had, and it had nine, uh, 71 revisions. So while I don't see this, only 10 names in the Word document, there's at least saved the number of times it was edited. And this document was edited 71 times, and you wonder, a protocol of a meeting edited so often, have you changed it afterwards? It's very strange. Um, Oh, here we have again a case of many auto recoveries. Um, I think that was that with the word um, examples. I had another one um, which was very nice. Um, you, the document started edit, being edited on a Mac with the name um, Customer Files uh, Letterhead 1. And then this was iterating the names until it was uh, information brochure or something like that on a Windows machine. So obviously you, you could see the whole odyssey from the graphic designer to the people using the documents afterward. Um, so the conclusions, you never know what is there in proprietary file formats. Um, and for example, the Microsoft um, knowledge base article had so many hints on further information in Word documents and how to remove them, and I wasn't able to find them. Um, so probably if you have some time at your hands, try to pass all these proprietary document formats, write parsers for them, and spider the internet. Uh, I can send you a DVD with uh, 100,000 or 150,000 documents um, and see what's in there. 
Open formats are only part of the solution. For example, Keynote, um, with which this presentation is done, saves its um, presentation as an XML file. Um, but this XML is so complex, you uh, really don't know what's in there. Um, at least if you don't spend your whole time in um, learning the format. And um, spider web, look for interesting files on other pages, uh, on other people's pages, and enjoy what you find there. So, are there questions? Yeah. Um, Auto recovery. Yeah, sure. The, the, no, not only the file path, but the whole uh, the file name, but the whole path, which usually contains uh, the server name and so on. Yeah, you're right. If you want to, I still have a bonus track, and I think I have another five minutes. Um, the goons are far away; they at least need five minutes. Okay. <laughs> um. There, for at least for PDF, there is special software already to scrub them. Um, I forgot the name of this software, but I found the demonstration on the internet. You have a PDF, and you mark what you want to be gone, and then the software not. Oh, <laughs> removes it. <laughs> um, the software not only um, puts black um, boxes there. And perhaps in the image, we can, I don't know, but removes the real letters and exchanges them with minus signs. Um, if you want to go a step further, um, perhaps it should be mentioned that Microsoft is also offering a plug-in now to scrub information from MS Office documents, but um, who knows what just scrub there and what not, but you at least can try to use it. If you want to go a step further, people have long discussed if there's another hidden information in documents, just by the kind you write, the way you um, build your sentence, the kind of words you use, and this was discussed a lot in the cypherpunk community, if you can find the author of an anonymous posting by just machine analyzing this posting and comparing it with others. And if Atel did a program you mask, um, I think it's a very bad name, naming a program like a Unix system call, um, a Unix shell program. Um, but this is, to my knowledge, the first implementation trying to implement that. You have a um, group of text files. You say they are from the same author. And um, UMask can generate a fingerprint of them. And then um, you can compare that fingerprint with an unknown file. I think I can present that. So you're still unhappy with the font size, I guess. Okay. Can I ask a question while you do Yeah, sure. Is it the concept of UMask actually a very old concept? Yeah, I'm, but I'm not aware of any implementation of that up to now. Well, the reason why I ask is, I mean, that's something uh, I'm a history buff myself. And, you know, a lot of people say that William Shakespeare did write his own works. And uh, it, it was they actually developed the software for them and analyzed the text of Shakespeare's Yeah. Yeah. I think this guy um, wrote a book, author unknown, about this Shakespeare thing, and how he found the author of um, some anonymous book about the uh, election, uh, the Clinton election. Um, but to my knowledge, it was just mainly not a fully automated process, but it was just a tool helping him with manual with manual analysis, and you could use this program by Dave Atel to completely automate it, for example, use Usenet. Um, I am seen I have uh, less than two minutes. 
Um, you might just believe me that I fingerprinted some text by Dave Ahmed um, in this file, Dave Ahmed um, PKL. And now I run it against um, a text file, which is by the same guy. And now I have the match value of 275. And if I run it against the file by somebody else, Um, yeah, I get a much, much lower value. And since this is no digital thing, or no binary thing, same author or not, um, this value might even help me to find out if a um, writer is from the same ethnic group or something like that, uses the same words and construct, uh, construction of sentences. Um, you can Google for this program, just search for Dave A. Till and UMask. Um, it's very, very raw and very undocumented, uh, but I think it's very interesting to toy around with that. Or buy this book, Author Unknown. So thank you very much. It was a pleasure. <laughs>